heaven, God told all the men, He said, I want you to form two lines. He said, I want one line to be all the men who were head of their household while they were here on earth, and the other line for all the men who let their wives be the head of their household while they were on earth. And so they formed two lines, and, and so the line where the women were head of the household was like 100 miles long. And the line where the men were head of the household just had one man in it. And so God said, Ben, I'm ashamed of you. I created you to be the head of the household, and only one man here has made me proud. And so he turned to the man. He said, how did you manage to be the only man in this line? He said, my wife told me to get in this line. <laughs> so anyway, praise God. Well, this morning, I want to teach you on the title of this message is winning your race. And so everything in the kingdom of God is forward. It's moving ahead. Jesus said, if a man puts his hand to the plow and he looks back, that he's not fit for the kingdom of God. And so God expects us to grow in our walk with him. We should be further along today than we were a year ago, or further along than we were even a month ago. And so we can't stay in the same place. Philippians 3, verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so the Apostle Paul said, I have not apprehended. In other words, I have not made it yet. And here's a man who had the revelation of the New Testament and been called into the third heaven, uh, seeing Jesus Christ face to face and taking the gospel to much of the known world. But he said, I'm not there yet. And you know, a lot of times people get born again and then they're satisfied and they think that's it. You know, I'm through. I'm going to heaven and, and that's all I need. And they think that, that that is all that God has for them. But that's just the beginning. That's the birth and that's the starting point in the Christian life. It's not the end. Come on, being born is just the beginning of life. And so the Bible really gives images of, of growing in Christ. And it's God's will that we grow. The Bible says we're being conformed into the image of Christ. It says that we're being changed from glory to glory. That we go from faith to faith. And we go from grace to grace. And so the Bible says we are the planting of the Lord. And so God has great things for us. But they don't all happen right at once. They don't happen when you get born again. That is just the, begin, the beginning. So every one of us has a race to run. We have a course to run and a course that God has laid out for us. And just because God has a purpose for us and a destiny and a course for us doesn't mean that we're automatically going to find it. But we have to seek God's will if we're going to find it. And God said, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen? And so there's some seeking involved. When, I, when my girls were little, you know, I used to hide Easter eggs for them. And so I would hide Easter eggs where, you know, it would take a little effort for them to find them. I wanted them to find them, but I, you know, I wanted it to be a challenge. And so the same thing is true when it comes to the things of God and the will of God. God wants you to find his will, but he doesn't just make it obvious. There, there's some seeking on your part and some looking required. Amen? Some seeking of God. And so every one of us has a race to run. But the good news is that God will complete the good work that he began in us. And when you get born again, God began a good work in your heart and in your spirit. And he will be faithful to complete that work if we will seek him with all of our heart. And so there was a dissatisfaction in Paul's life. Even with all that he attained spiritually and his knowledge and, and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and he worked miracles. He did all these things, but still there was a satisfaction. He dissatisfaction. He said, I want more. Come on. He said, I want more of God. There was still a hunger in his heart for the things of God that he wanted more, even though with all, all that he had attained. And so we should never be satisfied in our experience with God. And a lot of times, you know, folks will get saved and, and maybe, you know, God has blessed their life. And of course, when you serve God, he's going to bless you and things are going well. And so they, they center in and, and they become 
content in the wrong way. You know, the Bible says to be content in the place that you're at, but they get to where they're not really hungry for the things of God. And you know, if you're not hungry for the things of God, it doesn't really matter what's available. If you're, hung if you're not hungry, you're not going to receive because you're not hungry to eat. But we have to stay hungry for the things of God if we're going to grow. The Bible says as newborn babies to desire the milk of the Word. Amen? To desire to eat spiritually. And so Paul wanted more of God. And so we have to move forward into the best that God has for us. Amen? And so God has great things for us. And I believe the sky is the limit if we'll stay hungry and we'll seek God and find out what He wants to do in our life and we'll be obedient and take steps of faith. God has great things for each and every person's life. Amen. And so some Christians don't have any more of God than they had 20 years ago. And that's a shame. Amen. Because God wants to do so much more. He wants us to progress. And it's really our spiritual hunger that determines how much of God that we have. Amen. If you want to grow, you have to eat. Yeah. Come on, if you look at somebody big, and you know whether they're fat or whether they're muscle or whatever, if they're really big, they've been doing some eating. Yeah. Come on, they, you know you don't grow accidentally. You have to eat, and there has to be a hunger if you're going to eat. Amen. The same thing is true in the things of God. If you're going to grow spiritually, you got to eat. You got to feed on the Word of God. You've got to be nourished by the Spirit of God and get in the presence of God if you're really going to grow. And we can't compare ourselves to other people or other Christians because we can always find somebody who's worse off than us. Amen. And you know, if we compare ourselves to them, maybe we'll feel pretty good. But we need to compare ourselves to the Word of God. And that's why the Word is like a mirror. Come on, you may think you look pretty good until you look in the mirror. Sometimes I start thinking, I'm, I start feeling kind of slim. And then I'll, I'll look in the mirror and find out it ain't so. Come on, and so you may think that you look pretty good until you look in the mirror. And when you look into the Word of God, then you get a reflection of what you are and what you should be. Amen. That's why you have to read the Word of God to be able to grow spiritually. Come on, you need to see where you should be. And where you need to be. And the things that God has given you. And, and what God has made you. Who you are in Christ. And the things that he has for you. And when you look in the mirror. You find out. Hey I've got some growing to do. Come on I've got some things that I need to do. And so you know. Some people say if I can just make it to heaven. One man told me. He said if I can just get to heaven by the skin of my teeth. Then I'll be happy. But you know, I looked at his clothes and he didn't have any teeth. And, uh, and so I'm not going to be happy just to make it to heaven by the skin of my teeth. Amen. I want to have a reward. I want God to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't want to say, "Woo!" I don't know how I made it up here, but somehow I did. You know, and, and uh, but I want to be blessed whenever I get to heaven. And so we can't be satisfied in the place that we are, but we continually have to grow and continually have to move on. And you know how you grow? You grow by overcoming challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, your faith is, is your faith grows whenever it's exercised. Yeah. And you exercise your faith to believe God for things, believing for the unseen. Yeah. And there's things that you're believing God for that you haven't seen the answer yet, but then faith has to believe, faith has to stand. And whenever you exercise your faith, it grows and it gets a little bit stronger. I can believe God for much more today than I used to could in many different ways. And, you know, especially financially. You know, and before I went into ministry, you know, I would write everything down and I had to figure out how exactly where every penny was going to be and where it was coming from and all those things. But, you know, when I went in ministry, that just all went out the window. Amen. I had to... Believe God and trust God. But actually I was too rigid. Come on, I had to learn to exercise my faith and trust God that he could do things that I could not see. Yeah. Amen. Yes. But I had to go on and do the will of God and be happy. Yes. Amen. Knowing that he was going to provide, that he was going to take care of me. Yes. I had to just keep on going. Amen. The Bible says 
you have to cast your cares and your worries upon him. And it's true in finances. It's true in your health and your healing. It's true in the life of, of your children, of your family. It's true in the area of divine protection. It's true in every area that your faith is your faith grows as you see God bring you through problems. And as you see God bring answers to your prayers, then your faith gets stronger. But you know, God's don't respect your persons. If somebody else has a strong walk with God, that just simply means that I can too. Yeah. That if I do what they did, I can have what they have. Amen? He's no respecter of persons. And so God wants to use us in a mighty way, and he'd like to do great things for us, but we have to be available. Amen? And the reason why God doesn't use us many times is that we haven't made ourselves available or that we don't have the desire to do the works of Jesus. But Jesus said we could do his works and even greater works. Amen? That's the power that has been given to us. And so many times we don't realize the power that's given to us, but the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of us. And so Paul said this one thing I do. And you know, I've, uh, being a pastor for many years, you see people come to church and maybe accept Christ and then they drop out. You know, and they, you know, they serve God for a while, then they drop out. And they're, they're like a termite in a yo-yo. They can't decide which side they should be on. And, uh, and I mean, you know, they're just kind of wishy-washy and, you know, serve God a while and you don't see them for a while. And, and uh, you know, they're just kind of in and out. And then other people are just trying to do too many things. The Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do. And so God has called us to do one thing. He said, reaching for what's ahead. Come on, he didn't have his eyes set on the past and the things that have happened to him, whether good or bad. He said, but I'm reaching forward to what God has ahead of me. And he has good things ahead of you. It doesn't matter if you're 90 or if you're 19. God has good things ahead of you. And if you're 90, praise God, God will give you a full life and satisfy you. But even when this life ends, come on, something bigger and greater begins. And you know, when I used to pre preach in the prisons, and I preach, you know, even if you've blown it in this life, you still have eternity to look forward to. Amen. Amen. Because it's not too late. As long as you have breath in your lungs, Come on, God can restore, but then God has a great eternity for you. Amen? And so get your eyes upon eternity. And so Paul said he's pressing forward to things that are ahead. He's using, he's using the analogy of a race. And if you want to win a race, you have to look at what's ahead. You can't be looking behind you. But you have to concentrate on one thing. If you're racing, you got to concentrate on one thing, and that's winning that race. Yeah. And you know, if you look at athletics and, and athletes, they usually specialize in one thing. And in baseball, you know, the pitchers pitch, and that's all they do. And then the designated hitters, they just hit. They don't field or, or anything else. That's all they do. If you look at football, you know, the quarterbacks, they, they got to throw the ball and lead the offense. But but that's, that's all they do. The receivers catch the ball. The runners, uh, the uh, backs run the ball. The offensive linemen block. That's, that's all they do. The kickers kick. And, and so they all specialize in something. And so the same thing is true. If we want to excel in the things of God, we have to set our priorities on that. Amen? And we have to set our focus on that. And, and so set our focus on one thing. And so Mary and Martha were sisters and Jesus went to their house to visit and, and even though they were sisters they were totally different and so Mar uh, Martha was a task oriented person and, and Mary was a people person. She liked to talk and she liked to fellowship and, and Martha was the kind of person that you know she's not going to sit down if there's work that needs to be done and she didn't sit around and talk you know something's going on and so and so they, Jesus goes to their house, and so Mary's fellowshipping with Jesus, and, and Martha's in the kitchen trying to prepare a meal. And so Martha gets ticked off because Mary's talking and not helping her. And she goes in, she says, tells Jesus, said, you know, aren't you upset that my sister's not helping me? Tell her to come and help me. And so Jesus said, Martha, Martha, he said, you are concerned about 
many things. Come on, he said you're upset about many things. And so, uh, he said you're actually, he said you're troubled about many things. And so, actually, the, the word many means trivial things, or it means small things. And so, and so Martha, you know, Jesus is, is there, and so Martha's upset about serving Jesus, even when Jesus is in the house. And so she's not able to receive from Jesus because she's upset about her sister. But really, she was upset about things that didn't really matter. If Jesus comes to my house, I'm not going to worry about cooking a meal for him. Come on, because he can multiply the bread and the fish. You know, he can, he can make his own meal. Amen? I'm going to be spending time with Jesus and being able to receive from him. And so the same thing is true in church. You know, a lot of folks in the straight have people who serve. You couldn't, you couldn't do it without them. But sometimes when people are serving, they get upset about small things. Yeah. And sometimes they get troubled about different little things. You know, well, nobody's helping me or, you know, something really in the whole scheme of things is trivial. Yeah. You know, sometimes people say, well, I'm doing all the work and what about so-and-so? They're not... Me. And so Martha wasn't able to receive from Jesus because she was too busy judging Mary. Oh, yeah. Come on. And how many people come to church and they can't receive because they're judging somebody else? Or they're mad at, at somebody else, you know? And they had their eyes on somebody else, but they had their eyes on trivial things instead of receiving from God. Come on, God's in the house. We have to focus in on Him. We've got to forget about all the other things that are going on to be able to receive from Him. And so, Jesus told Martha, He said, one thing is needful. Come on, and she and Mary has chosen the best part, which was the fellowship with Jesus. And so, uh, Mary's more interested in spiritual things than she is in having a meal or having a clean house. And and so there's, she's mentioned three different times in the Bible, and all three times she's sitting at Jesus' feet receiving. And so she's the one who anointed Jesus' feet with expensive perfume because she loved Jesus, and it pleased him. And so if Jesus came to your house, what would you do? Would you spend time with him, or would you be worried about, you know, the natural things and the physical things around you? But we have to center in on him. And, and if God could have one thing from you today, what would he want? He would want your love and your affection. He would want your heart. He would, work, he would want your worship. Amen? That is exactly what God would want. But Martha was so busy serving Jesus that she didn't have time for Jesus. Think about that. <coughs> And especially if you're in vocational ministry, you understand that. You can get so busy serving Jesus that you don't have time for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't make that mistake. Amen? And so, but church members can make that same mistake too. You're so busy serving this activity, that activity, and not necessarily serving at church. It may be in other areas or other organizations, but you're so busy doing things that you don't have time for the one thing. The one thing that's really important, which is your relationship with God and the place that you receive your spiritual strength. Amen? Amen. And you receive your strength in relationship with Him. Yeah. Because without Him, we can do nothing. Right. But whenever we spend time with Him, then we receive from Him. And so, uh, another time, a man had been, bo been born blind, and so Jesus healed him, and he could see him. And so the Jews didn't believe it was actually a miracle. And so they questioned the man's parents. And, and they said, you know, was he, was he really born blind? The parents said, well, ask him. He's an adult. And, and so they asked him. They're asking him all these questions. He said, I only know one thing, that I was blind and now I can see. Amen. And you know, to give your testimony, you only have to know one thing. And that's what God has done for you. You don't have to be a theologian. Come on, it only takes one thing to, to receive from God and make contact with Him. And you all, all you have to be able to share is what God has done for you. Praise God. And so, 
Paul said, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. And so the devil doesn't want you to forget your past or forget your sins. But you know, God doesn't remember your sins. When you confess them and you forsake them, God doesn't remember your sins. Now your, your kin folks might remember them, but God doesn't remember them. People might remember them, but God doesn't remember them anymore. And, and so because God forgets them, then we have to forgive them. Yeah. And one of the devil's key strategies is to get people thinking about their past and their mistakes and or maybe even their shortcomings and where, you know, where they come up short and then bring condemnation to their life so he can keep them from serving God and, and doing all the things that God wants to do through them. And so we can't get we can't get caught up on our past, the things that have happened, the Apostle Paul said, I put my past behind me. He said, I'm pressing to what is ahead of me. Whatever your past was, whether it was good or whether it was bad, it doesn't matter today. What matters is the course that you have to run and the race and the things that God has ahead of you. And so God has forgiven us. He has adopted us into his family. Amen. And so if we're looking back, then we're not running the race. Amen. Amen. But if you're running a race, man, you've got to be looking forward. And so the Bible says, remember Lot's wife. The angel took her out of the city and said, don't stop till you get to the mountain. But she stopped and she looked back. Come on and, and miss the rest of her life. And so when God gets you out of a pit, don't look back. Amen. When God brings you out and he puts you on the path to where he's going to take you, you can't look back and say, man, you know, I wish I could go back there. But if you could, but there's nothing back there for you. Amen. Peter said, where else can I go? Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Amen. Amen. And so you can't look at the past. And so, you know, sometimes when God calls you to do something, especially like Tim and Annie making a, a geographical move and a, a total step of faith. When God calls you to do something, you know, there, when you face challenges, there can be a uh, tendency or temptation to want to look back. Yeah. But you can't look back and you move on yeah. and you have to move in faith. And so God is using that to grow and develop you to, to, so that he can make himself strong. Yeah. And so the children of Israel face the promised land. They come to the edge of the promised land. Three million people and they couldn't go in because of lack of faith. It wasn't because God wasn't going to be with them and, and help them kill the, kill the giants or overcome the challenges, but they couldn't go in because of lack of faith. And out of three million people, only two went in. Joshua and Caleb were the only two who went in because they had a spirit of faith. And so God has things for you in the future that you haven't possessed yet. Amen? But you're taking steps of faith and God has great things for you. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what Jesus did yesterday, he's still doing today, but he's doing it through people like you and me. And so he wants to work through us to do mighty things, but we have to step out in faith to see that happen. And so Paul said he's pressing Toward the go. Another scripture, he's saying that he said that he finished his course. And so he had his eye upon the prize. Come on, he had his eye upon the goal. And pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That tells me that every calling has a prize that goes with it. Yeah. In other words, if you fulfill your calling, there is a great reward and prize if you faithfully fulfill what God has called you to do. And God has called all of us to do something. Amen? It may not be vocational ministry, but he has a calling upon our life to be used to build up his kingdom. And so if we do that, come on, and we press forward, then there's a prize and there's a reward for our obedience. And so uh, God has a calling and destiny for us. And so Paul said he wanted to apprehend that which had apprehended him. Or he wanted to get hold of, of him who had taken hold upon him. And so our task is to find our calling and to do it. How do you find your calling? You do it. 
as you get involved in the house of God and the family of God, as you seek God, and as you begin to serve, then God begins to put desires in your heart, things that he wants you to do in the kingdom of God. And as you're faithful in doing those things, then God promotes you to other things. But God gives us desires, amen? And he gives us righteous desires and holy desires to be able to minister to other people and build up his kingdom, amen? And so Paul told King Agrippa, he said, I have, uh, I've been obedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, he poured his life into God's call. He poured his life and energy into God's calling upon his life. And so we're going to have to do the same thing if we're going to receive the prize of our calling. Okay. Amen. We're going to have to put our life and our energy in it to be able to excel. And so, you know, successful athletes are focused on the prize and on the reward. Imagine if, if you know, there was no score in football games. Nobody would watch. They just got out there and roughed each other up and threw the ball around and there was no winner or loser or there was no score. It would be pointless, wouldn't it? And so athletes are focused on the prize and on the goal. And, and so this time of year, the NFL, you know, they're thinking about the Super Bowl. And they're thinking about winning it all this time of year. And so we had to be focused on the prize. And so Paul said, I, I press, and that word for press, means to sprint. In other words, I'm going just as fast and hard and, and as hard as I can. And so, you know, when you're sprinting, you're not looking at anybody else. You're just looking at the finish line and you're looking at the goal line. And so God wants us to finish what he's called us to do. Yes. Come on. And there's so many people, I've known hundreds of people who started in a walk with God, but they never finished. They dropped out of the race at some point for some reason. You know, it could have been temptation, it could have been offense, discouragement, whatever it may be, but they dropped out of the race. But that's not God's will. God wants us to finish what he's called us to do. Praise God. And so if we're not focused, then we're not going to receive the prize. You know, I know a person who went to college for like six years and they never got their degree. And the reason why is because they didn't go for the prize. You know, they were just kind of taking classes and changed majors several times and never, never really went with a goal in mind. And so we have to make a decision and we have to stick with it. You know, some people make a decision to get physically fit and they'll join a gym and they'll go a couple times and never go again. Come on, some people will make a decision to go on a diet and it'll only last a week or two. I mean, you can identify with that. And you know, I read a book one time and it said one way to boost your confidence is to finish the things that you start. And I said, that's really good. And so I went home and looked in the icebox and there was half a pie there. And uh, so I went ahead and ate the rest of it. Praise God. I finished what I started. Praise God. But in our race, it's important that we finish what we start. Not just start out serving God, start out doing something for God, but to finish. Amen. And so I'm going to give an invitation this morning for anybody who say, Pastor, I want to get back in the race. Come on, maybe you started running the race, but for some reason you were distracted. Come on, and you got out of the race, but you say, I'm making a decision today. I'm going to get back in the race, run my race run my course, be all that God has called me to be. If that's you today, then raise your hand and say, I want to make that decision. Come on to do what God has called me to do. To be what God has called me to be. Amen. Others of you here today would say, Pastor, I want to press for the prize. Amen. I'm not going to stay spiritually in the place that I am. I don't want to stay spiritually in the place that I am, but I want to move on because I know God has greater, bigger things for me. If that's you, then raise your hand. Come on, I'm going to press forward. That's just about everybody here. If you stand to your feet today, I'm going to pray for you today. Come on, we're, we're going to make a fresh commitment to be all that God has called us to be. Amen? To move forward and move into bigger things and greater things and not just stay in one place, not to be satisfied, just to stay in one place 
Amen. But to move forward for a spiritual hunger. And so let's pray today. Father, we just thank you right now. Your will, your purpose for everybody who's here today. And Father, right now for those who've gotten out of the race, Father, we thank you right now that you're restoring them. You're bringing them back into the race, back into the call that you have for them. And Father, I thank you for helping them to adjust their priorities and be everything that you've called them to be. And Father, we pray for those who raise their hand that they want to move forward. Father, I thank you right now putting a greater hunger in their heart to move forward for you, Father. And I thank you for spiritual growth, growth and acceleration that you're cutting some things out of their life, that you're changing their priorities, Father, that they're adjusting their relationships and their time and, and everything that's involved in their life. And Father, I thank you that we as a church are hungry for you and hungry for more of you, Father. Not just to be satisfied, just to, just to be content, just to be saved, Father, but moving forward to, that you have more for us. Praise God. Praise God. Amen.